What's up, Wisconsin? Welcome back to the Inside Wisconsin Show here on YouTube and wherever you listen to podcasts. Trevor, John, I'm not going to lie. J.A., I am so glad that you're in a Warhawk t-shirt. I was not sure what to expect from you today. Look at you. I understand because of our guest. Yes. Uh, who coaches at a, a, a Midwest University west of the state of Missouri. Yeah. I can understand where you may add some trepidation. Uh, but And listen, I'm coming to you today, uh, as you see from my, my lovely background, a hotel room in Arkansas. Yeah. Um, it, remember, it's not your Kansas. It's not my Kansas. It's our Kansas, uh, <laughs> Arkansas, which has got the word in it. But I, you know, it's OK because they mispronounce it. But uh, nope, I'm here I'm a, as a, a proud Mizzou grad on my very best behavior because it's inside Wisconsin. Yes, so it is inside Wisconsin. I and my feelings inside on behalf of Wisconsin. Appreciate that, which is why you're wearing the Warhawk gear. I got the Warhawk hat on. We're talking to former Warhawk head coach, now Kansas head coach, Lance yep. Leipold. And so real quick, if, if you don't know, and we're going to talk about this later, John is doing us a solid because this, this rivalry thing between KU and Mizzou is absolutely bonkers. But Bad. Lance is from Wisconsin, from Jefferson, my hometown. You don't think I've had a couple buddies wondering when we're going to have him on? We have, and we finally got it done. So let's jump right in. This no, is no, no, no we can't don't jump, jump right in. I okay, thought you were from Johnson Crick. No, nah, I went to Crick High School. So I moved to Crick when I was 12, but I grew up in Jefferson. Like that's Lance and I went to the same grade okay. school. I just didn't go to Jefferson High School. So I wear both hats, Jefferson and Johnson Crick. So you're right. Yeah, yeah. I went to Crick understood. High School, but understood. Appreciate that. All right, we're jumping in. Lance Leipold on the Inside Wisconsin show. The Inside Wisconsin Show is brought to you by American Family Insurance, Aaron's Company, Blaine's Farm and Fleet, Capital Credit Union, Festival Foods, Quick Trip, Miller Lite, North Star Mohican Casino Resort, Provea Health, and the University of Wisconsin Platteville. Hey, remember to subscribe on YouTube, leave a review, smash the like button, just get with us. JA, this is a long time coming, man. That is the head coach of Kansas, but better known as UW Whitewater Stud. <laughs> Wisconsinite, just like you and I. That's Lance Leipold. Lance, Coach, good to see you, man. It's been some time. Well, it's great to be with you guys. It has been a while. Good to see your faces, and uh, pleasure to be with you. So he, he mentioned Whitewater. He mentioned you're at the Big 12 school, and in the middle there, you're in Buffalo. Um, and we've had success everywhere. So we're going to start right at the bottom. What what is What are those foundational principles that you bring to each of these stops that we got to instill in these kids before we get – the result that you're looking for? Oh, well, first of all, I, I've been blessed to have a, a nucleus of coaches that have been with me for a long time. And, and that, that really helps us to, to kind of hit the ground running, so to speak. But I, I still think when you go to the, our, our basic fundamentals of what we believe in, in, in building a program is daily improvement. Uh, you know, uh, what's your attitude, what's your effort, and what are you trying to do to get a little bit better each and every day? Um, and, and hold yourself to that standard. And, and I think sometimes with that, our attention to detail allows us to, to, to make the progress that we have at each stop. What part of growing up in Wisconsin did you get that from, Coach? You, from Jefferson, went to Whitewater, obviously coached at Whitewater, and we like to think selfishly that a lot of your success came from Wisconsin. Well, Is that uh, true? Well, I would think so. I, I think some of it, uh, it starts right in my home. I was very blessed to be uh, – raised by two parents who were teachers. My, my father played basketball at Whitewater, um, probably was a, a, a no, no frills type of guy and, and, and told me to focus on, on the little things, even though as a teenager, you'd always don't and don't understand. Uh, I used to joke probably at, in the early stages at, at Whitewater as a head coach, I said, I told, I started telling kids that uh, one day I woke up and I was my father, you know, I started saying all the things he was saying, but I think the other part was my my three years as a graduate assistant under Barry Alvarez and, and the, the, a lot of the foundational things at, at these last two stops, especially in Buffalo and Kansas, that uh, um, what you have to do at this level uh, to build a program and, and some of the qualities of effort, attitude, physical toughness and, and doing it, surrounding yourself with a quality staff. I, I like to think so. There, without a doubt, there's a there, there's there's a lot of Wisconsin in, in me and the, and the programs that I've been in charge of. When you build those things, uh, 
your first year is not one that's a championship season there at, at the university. Uh, Barry was one in 10 mm-hmm. his first year. It was like kids want to win right away and parents mm-hmm. want to win right away and fans want to win right away. How do you make sure that, you, you know, that, that as they build that patience is there to, to, you know, that you can see the end, but they would like to see it a lot sooner than you would. Yeah. It's a, another good question. Cause and I went through it, and, and John, not only year one, it's year two. In fact, a, after my first year at, Bu- at Buffalo, we were five and seven. The second year, we were two and ten. And I remember in the offseason, I had a, a chance somebody had arranged for me to sit down with Dave Clawson, uh, Wake Forest head coach. And he told me before the season, and he was from the Buffalo area and some other mm-hmm. things, so, but we had never met. And he said, he goes, Lance, you got to be prepared. Year two is, is more difficult than year one. And I was like, what do you mean? No way. You know, you kind of you kind of figure things out. But uh, that can be very different because a lot of times in the first year, guys, you, you kind of get the honeymoon feeling and, and, and buy in that way, especially on a program that maybe has not had success. And then then sometimes with with returning players, the resistance may happen in that in that second year. But also what you referred to in today and the ability to transfer and all those things. Everybody, we, we live in a, you know, I always, I always pick up my phone usually around this time because everything has to be instant. We want it now. We want it faster than before. And sometimes the, we lose sight of what that process is to obtain success in football. I'm going to take a, just a left off there because there was of, of Barry, because you were there then when they went to the Rose Bowl. Mm-hmm. which is, you know, kind of a like a um, seminal moment for so many of us, especially if you're my age, which is your age, and yeah. you waited for that to come along. Uh, what was that season like? What was that trip out to Pasadena like? Well, and, you know, so surreal. At the time, you don't even – when you're, when you're kind of looking at it happening and there's a couple wins along the way that you're like, hey, we – you know, you know, the Michigan game and the – the, the storming of the field. And you remember that, you know, the people that were injured, there were so many things in the next week, we, we tied Ohio state, but there, there's so many emotional games there, but I was, besides the Rose bowl, if you remember, John, we had the trip to Tokyo earlier that month and, yeah. and uh, you know, all the things that kind of went with it that year, but um, the year before um, we we're down at Northwestern and we were setting up a, a winning field goal. And, and we and we turned the ball over and, and we had essentially had agreed to go to a bowl game if we win that game. And we came up short and that was time. But it kind of fueled the fire. We knew we were on the cusp, but, um, you know, it was such an exciting time. And and when you kind of look at that time of how that energy changed the state of Wisconsin, that's what I remember most about just the disposition and the excitement of everything and how that carried itself out to Pasadena. You probably well remember, remember they had the ticket shortage of, of all the people they, that the, the travel, you know, the uh, travel agencies couldn't provide all the, something happened. I mean, all those things were such a story. And for us to to end that with a Rose bowl win was was so exciting and, and uh, something I'll always remember. Coach Alvarez was literally our first guest two and a half years ago on Inside Wisconsin. He talked about how it was a sea of red out there. It how was. many? Do you remember how crazy it was just with how well Wisconsin traveled? It was. It was crazy. It was awesome. It was such a sight at even some of the other events. And and you know I you know you're you're trying to stay in it and you know what your responsibilities are for the day and something like that. But as you guys were alluded, uh, alluded to, you know, being a small town Wisconsin guy and. And here it is, uh, you, you know, playing at Whitewater and doing all those things. And all of a sudden you're looking at it and here it is uh, New Year's Day and you're on a bus and you kind of see the mountains and, and you got the, the chips, highway patrol, whatever, escorting you in. And, we, and you roll into the, to the Rose Bowl and to see all that red and all those fans um, and the whole setting, it, it is truly special. And that's why, you know, Keith Jackson and everybody say what, what it was, the granddaddy of them all. And, and it was definitely a special time for Wisconsin football that, to me, really changed the course of that program. So I want to go back to you saying that year two is a little tough, which you proved at Whitewater. Came in, head coach, 07 national championship. Year two, no national championship, man. It must have been a down year. But then <laughs> yeah. 09, 10, 11, 13, and so on, national championship. Coach, you know, my brother played for you, right? That, he was <laughs> yeah. on that team when you guys won the national championship. That was the time of my life following you around 
And then I was in Salem, got this, literally got this hat out <laughs> there. Talk about how special it was to be a player at Whitewater, being from Jefferson, and then to come back as the head coach and just have the success you did. Yeah. You know, it's amazing, though, how you say that. We, and we were runner-up, and it was kind of like it was a major letdown, you know. But, right. uh, uh, yeah, you know, um, when I first got into coaching, this is kind of one of those when you, when you look at your – a few times you can look ahead, try to dream and, and look at stuff. And one day I was in grad school at Whitewater and I was walking around and, and all of a sudden I started to do the math of when Bob Brezowitz took over for Forrest Perkins as a head coach. And then I looked at my age and about the same time and I and it kind of hit me at that time, like, you know, just maybe, just maybe I could be the next head coach here. And then uh, sure enough, uh, you know, and, and that was about 19... 88. And uh, sure enough, in 2007, I had the opportunity to replace him and, and things had really kind of gone on the uptick. And I was, you know, I lived 13 years in Nebraska during that time. And, and so I wasn't very close to the program kind of doing, doing your own thing, but you find out that, um, you know, things had really been on the uptick, came up short two national championship games. So taking that thing over and, and having a nucleus coming back, you know, I, I guess the internal drive was to try to make sure we could get over the hump and give that group of players a national championship and give the, the, the university its first. So I, I have a number of whitewater questions from a program that I went to collegiately that did not win 46 in a row, uh, <laughs> which is the first part is when, when that streak builds, right? You want to win a bunch. At what point does that become a unique streak to this? Almost the kids feel like that's a yoke. All right. You're like, oh, my gosh, this just gets heavier and heavier. Yeah, you know, Common Trevor said when it was like when we didn't win it in 08, we only had like six seniors on the field. So I, I kind of looked back and it was kind of shocking. We made it back there and kind of got on a nice roll. Uh, and we lost two games that year. And I was kind of like, you know, on paper now, we got a chance to be pretty good here for a while. And, and, but the internal motivation of, I say, internal program, uh, competition really fueled that program. And I think I've tried to take that everywhere I've been. I've tried to, we used it here after we had portal editions that we're going to create a culture of competition. If you're afraid to compete daily in this program, you're going to have troubles making it. And, and that's kind of John, the, the fuel that it had that those three consecutive undefeated seasons came. And then we took a hit. We had some injuries and, and quite honestly, we weren't as talented and, and we, and we lost a couple games, but, I don't know if it still is. I was told at one time it's one like maybe the fifth longest win streak in 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 NCAA four year football. But I think there was some pressure there at the end that and and I and I even felt it towards the end of my career there that anything less than national championships and undefeated seasons were now being looked at as failure. And I didn't really feel that's why I got into coaching or I didn't feel it was fair to the kids. And uh, but at the same time, you got to embrace and, and enjoy those high expectations and, uh, and and enjoy the ride, so to speak. And the guys that were there before you, you mentioned Coach, Coach Perry. He was there like 29 years. Yeah. Next guy was 22. You were eight. You were like a short timer. <laughs> what was the impetus that you decided, though, that, OK, I, I have either loft or expectation, whatever it was. What was the impetus that you decided now I'm moving on? Well, John, I'm going to I'm going to probably say something I've never said before. I'm going to say I played for Forrest Perkins for two years. Bob Brezowitz was my position coach. Other than mm -hmm. my father, in my teenage years, I knew Bob as a high school coach. and He's very impactful. And and when I interviewed for the job, that question was asked to me about if I was going to be a short term um, and, you know, stay. And, and I actually said it was my goal, um, you know, to have three coaches in 75 years. And and I really thought it was going to be my last job. But as things progressed and, and things were happening, um, I felt myself kind of changing on things. And, and I go back in, in an area that we really haven't discussed here today is when when I left Wisconsin, my first full time job was at the University of Nebraska, Omaha, Division two school. Again, a rebuilding there. Our first year, we were one and ten. We were three and eight. And then we were ten and two. That was some of my most fulfilling time in my career. I really enjoyed that. And I started to think back to that after about six years at Whitewater. 
And I started looking for that. And I started to, you know, explore jobs at schools that were starting football or, or, you know, uh, you know, were really down. My son was, our son was really young at the time. And when our, when that win streak was broken, he cried more than anyone I saw. <laughs> and, and it was concerning to me as a parent. And I even felt myself is that, you know, we need to lose in life sometimes and, and we need to embrace the process and the ups and downs and failures. And, and sometimes um, finding those jobs that aren't as easy um, w- would benefit me in, in the long run. Then on a, on a, it was really strange on a, I dropped my son, son off at school um, after dropping our daughter off at another school. I had two phone calls in an hour's time from two completely different people that I know asking me if I was interested in the University of Buffalo job, which was so strange because in the Mid-American Conference, Buffalo was the furthest East school, never been there, never mm-hmm. been to New York, and the opportunity just kind of presented itself. And here we are. All those wins later and three jobs later. We'll get to more of that and also go back to our hometown. Lance and I share the same hometown. We have a lot of the same friends. If I don't talk about that, I'm going to get kicked in the face. So we're going to cover that here in a second. Back with more. Lance Leipold on the Inside Wisconsin Show. The Inside Wisconsin Show is brought to you by American Family Insurance, Aaron's Company, Blaine's Farm and Fleet, Capital Credit Union, Festival Foods, Quick Trip, Miller Lite, North Star Mohican Casino Resort, Provea Health, and the University of Wisconsin Platteville. Hey, remember to subscribe on YouTube, leave a review, smash the like button, just get with us. JA, my son's football team is officially off and running. He plays eighth grade tackle football, the Fox okay. Valley Saints, Rody. Uh, we 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 tailgate for these games. We did it as a seventh grader last year. He's eighth grade this year. It's, it's really fun. I know it's a bit much, but I was gonna say, is that a little extreme? I don't know. Yeah, good community. Like People the main thing where you called it tackle football, which is good. <laughs> tackle. Well, that's the thing. Right. Anyway, yes, it is extreme, but it's great community. A lot of the parents get together and and grill out and so on. So uh, we have another tailgate coming up this weekend, and I, I don't know if I've asked you this in the past, so forgive me if I have. But are you a parboil Oktoberfest brat guy from Festival Foods? Like, do you you parboil those and then put them on, or are you a Slap the Oktoberfest brat right on the grill and just slow cook it so it doesn't go bonkers. Generally, due to time constraints, I just fire it on the grain, uh, on the grill, and we go that oh. way. And actually, I don't mind a little hot to get it to sear and pop open. This is true. Yeah, it, it, if you don't control the temperature, though, yeah, they, it goes bonkers. It starts. Well, sure. I'm not looking to make them into charcoal briquettes. That's for sure. Yeah, but yes, <laughs> whatever which way you do it, you can't go wrong. Head to Festival Foods and look up the God amazing amount of different flavors of Oktoberfest brats they have. I think I bought like as many as I could and dumped them on the desk here when we had Mark on. They're all gone. We got to buy some new ones. But when you do it, whether it's midsummer or here in the fall, buy the Oktoberfest brats from Festival Foods. Lots of different flavors that you can choose from. And then you do you. Parboil them if you want. Put them on raw if you want. They're good either way. Whether it's a Lambo tailgate or an eighth grade football. Do you football guys game. yell at the refs? Do you guys yell at the refs? No comment. We are back in between segments with Coach Lance Leipold. Time for today's top five list presented by Wisconsin's leaders in STEM, the University of wisconsin Platteville. UW Platteville offers nationally ranked STEM programs and its graduates stay in Wisconsin, leading at top companies right here at home. Find out more at uwplat.edu slash engineering. What does STEM stand for, John? Do you know? Science, technology, uh-huh. uh, something math. Engineering. Engineering math, yep. Science, yeah. technology, engineering math. That's cool. And they, they're leaders in engineering at Platteville, and clearly the STEM program is important to them, so that's cool. Check it out if you are looking. All right, top five list time. J.A., what do you got? Ball's in your court again. Well, first off, I know what the J and J school stands for. I don't know if that's journalism. <laughs> got it. Technology. <laughs> so, uh, so we have Kansas. We have the Kansas coach on. Uh, the Packers do not have a wealth of history of KU people involved in the organization, but they have some significant people involved in the history of the Packers. Okay, so these are the top five KU Packer sort of uh, connections, players, coaches of significance. Interesting. 
I like top it. Five. All right. Again, as I said, it kind of gets to number five. Do you know who Bucky Scribner is? No. That's really a shame. You should know who your Packer punters were. Okay. But he was, but here's the thing. He was drafted in 1983. I thought you might know who he was since that's when the dawn of time started and you might know him. <laughs> no, of course I don't know. Okay. So he was picked in the I sixth that, round. He punted two years, was okay. And then they, they kicked him out. He went and played with the Vikings and uh, I don't know who they brought in, Don Bracken or somebody. But anyway, so the Bucky Scribner. Four is Nolan Cromwell. Okay. Is a name you should know. I do. Uh, he was a great defensive back for the Rams out of KU. He was an un, he was probably a better track athlete. Sorry about that at KU than he was a, a football player, which is saying something because he was all league both as a defensive back and he was the offensive player of the year when he got so good at defensive back they made him their quarterback. Uh, but he coached under Mike Holmgren and he was the special special teams coach and might have had a year at the receivers during their heyday. He was on the Super okay. Bowl staff. Nolan Cromwell. Um, and when he played for a while, just one of the great mustaches of all time. Uh, <laughs> three, uh, you might recall when Paul Kaufman said, do you remember uh, who the first two draft picks were in 1977? And I said, well, yeah, it was Mike Butler and Ezra Johnson. Mike Butler went to KU. And so Butler, he was, um, he, he, I, he had probably had 40 some sacks, but he was, he was a defensive end and played for many, many years for the Packers, seven, eight seasons for the Packers. So he's number, oh, cool. number three, number two lives in infamy, which is John Hadle, which was the worst trade in franchise history. And many consider the worst trade in NFL history, right? It was a 35 year quarterback. He had had a great, he'd been, you know, AFL with the chargers. He had a great year with the, with the Rams and then midway through the next season, they traded him to the Packers for two ones, two twos, and a three. Wow. That was 1974. And he ended up playing, and I think in those two years of, I think he played, what, 18, 19 games, and he threw 29 interceptions, and it was an unmitigated disaster. And I'm trying to think if when they gave away the 22s, uh, the two number ones that I think that was 75, 76. And then the first number one they had after that was actually Mike Butler. Didn't Dan Devine make that trade? Dan Devine made that trade for a Missouri guy who had seen yeah. him play. He would played against him against, he had coached against him uh, all time. Um, like he coached the 68 team, which was the last Kansas team to win a conference championship in 1968. That's how pathetic they are. 1968 is their last conference championship. Got it. That's number one. Was, Ask me when Mizzou's last conference championship was. Clearly before, more recent than 1968. Yeah, 1969. <laughs> <laughs> I would not have guessed that. Yeah, so we're equally pathetic. That's why okay. I can get all in on this. And Got number it. one, I think probably the most significant Packer that has associated with KU, you love him. The great I love figure. him? You love him. Oh, the great yeah, figure. yes, I do. Robert Brown was a KU guy. Though he was drafted by the Vikings, he ended up with played his whole 10 years in Green Bay. And so, yeah, number one's the grave digger. Love it. I did not that's know that he went to KU. That's great. That just came for you. You get. I know you love Big Gilbert. I do. Well, that's a cool list, and it goes back a ways. Sorry, I didn't know the guy from '83. I was two months old when he got drafted. Just saying. Yeah, you I don't know. Lincoln was president too. You're on the hook. Yeah, good to go. All right, top five list. That's a good one, Jay. Hey, thanks for doing that. Back to Coach Leipold. We are back the Inside Wisconsin Show, Trevor. John and Lance Leipold, the head coach of Kansas, but we know him best as one of us here from Wisconsin. So I mentioned it before. Lance and I grew up in the same hometown, Jefferson, Wisconsin. I think we went to the same grade school. Lance, did you go to St. John's? Uh, St. John's Lutheran, yes, I did. Yeah, buddy. Yeah, yeah man. Gotcha. So the Falcons. And we have a, Falcons. The Falcons. <laughs> yeah, wild. Jeez. So uh, we have a lot of mutual friends. My brother played for Lance at UW Whitewater. Uh, and then – the communications guy there at KU is from Wisconsin too. And it has me thinking how many guys travel with you on the coaching staff that are still from Wisconsin, Lance, how many of those oh. guys did you pluck from Whitewater? Well, Brian Borland's our defense coordinator. Brian, we've been together all 17 years. Brian's from Fort Atkinson, grew up five miles apart. Um, Chris Simpson, our linebackers coach is a Whitewater grad. Uh, went to Whitefish Bay Dominican. He's from the Milwaukee area. Grant Murray, our director of player personnel is a, uh, Mequon Homestead guy, um, Jim Zabrowski, our quarterback coach, was a head coach at Lakeland College and then was our first offensive coordinator. Jim's, Jim was with us and rejoined us in Buffalo after a stint with Jerry Kill at Minnesota. 
And I'm trying to keep everyone else straight from there now. I think that's mainly it. But again, a, a, a good nucleus of guys. Um, again, I, I believe in continuity and alignment. Um, as you say, we, we you know, football is football to me. You, if you surround yourself with good people that know the game, Andy Kolnicki, I guess I, I forgot Andy. Andy was the offensive coordinator. He's 11 years with me. I was trying to think at the beginning of these, but Andy's River Falls grad. Um, but he's been, uh, you know, was the OC at Whitewater last two seasons. So, you know, again, we've been able to keep that continuity. Um, the unique thing, I guess, Trevor, too, is I've got two – well, Jim Zabrowski's a Mount Union grad, but our strength coach, Matt Gildersley, played on some of those uh, uh, oh. – so, so, again, higher winners, higher winners, and, oh. and it's yeah. kind of cool. So, yeah, we got two Mount Union guys on the strength staff. and okay. um, you know, All right. Happy for you. Good. I and hate you. And you were worried about me, Trevor. Yeah, you you're right. I was. I didn't think Mountain Union was going to come up. I'm not going to lie. I yeah. hate those hey. guys. All right. Oh, I'm good. oh I, have, I have a lot of fun with it. You know, he told me <laughs> he told me they took their second place trophies, you know, the, and him and his senior class. And and uh, they, they had a big bonfire. And I, I kind of looked at him one night. And I said, geez, that must have been a pretty big fire. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, <laughs> anything else, Trev? You need to get out of your system, or you? I'm all good right? now. I, I just I didn't see it coming. That's all. I just okay. uh... we're on the inside Wisconsin show. And we've made a bunch of that, but when I look back, if you if you literally go to the core with with uh, Coach Alvarez, mm-hmm. and then you said you were in in Omaha, and there's Frank. So you got a lot of Nebraska yeah. and Dr. Tom in you, right? I mean, I feel like that's got to yeah. have infiltrated your your coaching in some way, shape, or form. Yeah. You know, John, I'll just say this before that as well. When you talk about everybody and where it's at, you know, you know, Barry's staff was so strong with, you know, Bill Callahan, Brad Childress. I mean, Jay Norvell's the head coach at Colorado State, uh, you know, Dan McCarney. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I look back at some of those other guys and and just to have the, the, the great fortune to sit in the room with those guys every day for three years and just how much you're, you're able to soak in and, and learn through a really almost osmosis of, of taking it in and forming yourself. And then Pat Burns is the guy I worked for for 10 years in Omaha, but three years with Frank Solish and of course all the influence from, from Tom Osborne. And, and in my first year down there working in a recruiting role, um, we did go to the national championship game at the Rose Bowl against Miami. So to see the thing, to see that program, the culture, the expectations, and also the system, I, I think also helped formulate uh, part of who I am today. I think my time off the field as an assistant in those three years made me understand and appreciate support staff as we get to a place like Kansas and how much alignment and understanding and the value that the people that aren't necessarily on the field with you every day play an impact in how you build your program. Mm -hmm. And so if we take that all the way where you sit in that office right now, um, what was that project like when you, when you took that job? Because like the history is used to be right. K state, when you and I grew up, that was yeah. really until Coach Schneider came along. Uh, but but that that's a hill. I know the I know the university sits on a hill, but yeah. you, that's that's quite a hole to dig out of. Where did you right. start on that thing? Well, first of all, as, as you know, I I took the job like May first, which is the most unconventional time. I, I rolled into town. Uh, I flew in. My wife and family came in, and they're walking off the field from their last walkthrough before the spring game. Then on Monday, they're starting to leave town and I'm trying to meet with everyone and they're leaving town for three weeks, our players as the semester ends. So very unique. Uh, we, had, we went into it blind the first year. And again, we're just setting expectations of how we're going to fundamentally go through this and, and building relationships, trust, establishing what we're going to do schematically, but also foundationally within the program. And it was it was unique and it was tough. And um, this program had a lot of people leaving, uh, even from the year before, as you said, this program had struggled for 12 plus years. And then, uh, you know, we started to kind of get into a little more of a routine and, and though we, didn't, we went down to Austin, Texas and upset a Texas team. And I think that was the shot in the arm of belief that this, this program and, and this staff could get it done. And we played well the next two weeks and propelled us into, uh, last season's, uh, Five and zero start and three consecutive sellouts. College game day showing up here and a lot of things now to give us the momentum that that we have going heading into this season. And yet, last year the Wisconsin job comes open. 
and you couldn't help but know that your name was going to get thrown into that mix. I don't need to know if anybody reached out to you or talked to you or whatever the case may be, but there's always that feeling of wanting to get home, right? And your name came up a bunch. As a matter of fact, I have a friend who's a huge K-State fan, and his buddy's a KU fan, and I had that guy completely convinced that you were leaving. It was awesome. I was like, oh, he's gone, man. He's coming home. What is it, though? I mean, there's something about that, right? You just It's Wisconsin. Yes and no. Okay. Um, yeah, that's special. And there's times there and, and things, but, um, you know, people said the same thing when the Nebraska job opened and, and I lived there for 13 years and my wife's from Omaha, but you know, I, I think it's, it goes back to even what, what John had said earlier. I think a lot of this goes back to, to Barry Alvarez and you look at Barry Alvarez and, and his career and different times. And I remember even talking to him one time about, he had a chance and did take advantage to do something special at Wisconsin that hadn't been done. And I look at this stage of my career and where I'm at and what we can do. We have a chance to do something here at Kansas that people don't think can get done. And that's special to me. The other two places, and mainly as you're asking me, Trevor, about Wisconsin is everything you're doing is, is, is trying to reach Barry Alvarez standards in my estimation or what Brett Bielema did after that. And here we have a chance to do things that, that no one thought can get done. And, and, and I really cherish that. We're happy here. We really like living here. A lot of the same values as, as living in Wisconsin and great people. And, uh, and this is where we expect to be for, for until it's over. I worked in Oklahoma for many, many years. And I watched the basketball program there try to build in the shadow of the football program. You're kind of in reverse. Yeah. How do you leverage the success that Bill has in that program and try to, you know, yeah. capitalize on that in, in, in your, in your spot? Well, uh, well, first of all, after I accepted the job, before I got on the plane, after I talked to Travis Goff, our athletic director, the next phone call I received was from Bill self. And, and that meant a lot. And I think he understands um, having a successful football program is going to really help this university and it's going to help him as far as everything. Um, John, I, I assume you've been to Allen Fieldhouse in your time. It's a special place. And the energy <laughs> and everything that goes into that is special that you can use in recruiting. And, and it's something that you want to emulate and try to, you know, transition itself in the David Booth Kansas Memorial Stadium and all those things. So that mm -hmm. success, that tradition, that that passionate fan base, we've got to we, we can use to our advantage. So I, 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 we, we don't have time. I'll just say this. I've been in Allen Fieldhouse twice and uh, neither time did I make it to the end of the game. Both times uh, I, I left. Once was of my own accord and once I was asked to leave. <laughs> <laughs> I was a younger man. OK. OK. <laughs> and in the last college track meet I ran in, which was a big eight meet, was actually when the track was still in the football stadium. Wow. And wow. now it's up there. That's how old I am. Uh, what was it like, though? I, I don't know if this is a cultural stamp on the program or like what was it like when the circus of game day came through? Because that to me, when when that shows up, right, that is um, like that's yeah. it's like when you're a sports center and you do your first sports center. This is sports center commercial. Like yeah. there's some legitimacy of what happens. But what was it? What was the circus like when that came to town? You know, as you know, when you're playing in it, you know, it, it was as you know, you know, all those guys and they're good people and and things. And and we had a chance after our walk through, um, obviously, uh, you know, like Jen Latta, who works in Milwaukee. And I had a chance. Mm -hmm. She did some things when we were at Whitewater. So having someone you kind of know there and introducing people, but you know, to me, you know, Kirk and David and, and, and everyone, Desmond, it, it was neat. And you know, again, for a program like this, it's, it's like, yeah, this is all right. This is it. And to see the Hill on that day and pull in now, here you are getting ready for kickoff. We're playing TCU. All those things are happening and, and people are grabbing me and kind of taking me up everywhere. And it, it, it was, uh, it happened so fast in many ways it was a blur but uh i know my family and others that came in they they still talk about it what a great what a great atmosphere and experience so wisconsin breeds winners that's what i heard you say in all of that is that <laughs> you're you're doing well i thought it was interesting though that it's also contagious i saw recently that you brought down uh the coach from kimberly steve jones tell us about yeah. that 
Well, Steve Jones, you know, is, uh, you know, got more into, uh, I don't want to say motivational speaking because I don't view it that way. It's more leadership training. And it was funny because our strength coach, Matt Gildersleeve, um, as I said, one of the Mount Union guys, but Matt Spade does a great job in, in, in really instilling and doing, a, you know, our, our cultural development in our program, especially in the off season when we cannot be with the players. And he comes in, he goes, hey, I'm reading this book, Twin Thieves. And, you know, it's been written by this guy that used to coach his name, Steve Jones. I go, I know Steve Jones. And, <laughs> and uh, so last uh, last spring, um, you know, four of us coaches with Wisconsin Ties flew up to Madison to speak at the state clinic. And Steve was there and, and Matt, our strength coach, went with. I said, why don't you guys get together and talk and, and see, see if it lines up. While the rest of us were doing our thing, they went and had coffee somewhere, and uh, he says, this is spot on for what we want. So Steve came down, spent about uh, two and a half days with us. We're going to have him down again. Very impactful. Does a great job. Um, for a guy who went to Stevens Point, he, you know, he's pretty decent. And uh, he was impactful of, uh, you know, and again, we, you know, he's humble, highly successful. You know, back when I was at Whitewater, Steve asked me to come up and talk to his team one time. So it, it goes back and, and it's pretty cool. And uh, he, he's a good person. And I'm trying to recommend him to as many other of my colleagues as I can. John, let me ask one more quick one before we take a break. I think that's fascinating, right? Because we, we actually had Coach Jones on the show and we yeah. asked him why he never went to the next level. Right. And so mm -hmm. there you are at Whitewater. But that was for lack of better terms, a step down, right? You were in D1, you were in Nebraska and coached at Wisconsin, and then you decided to go D3. Now, anybody that's from our area goes, oh, he came home, right? But there there had to have been something in your head that went, all right, I'm going to stay here for a bit in an effort to work my way back up. True? Um, yes and no. I, I, I said this even when I was there. I knew Whitewater based on facilities, resources, locality, recruiting base. I knew after 10 years of coaching Division II, I knew it was better than 80% of the Division II jobs out there. So, and, and again, coaching isn't the, the logo, uh, you know, you know, yes, pay and things change, but if you're hung up on the logo and, and how many people are at the games, because I do say this, whether it be in Pasadena, Austin, Texas, Kansas, or Whitewater, when the games kicked off, the games played at eye level and you're doing your job. And if you're worried about how many people are there, um, you're, you're in it for the wrong reasons. I, I really believe that. Well, there was a lot of people there at the end, man. When I was going to those games anyway, which was your beginning, we yeah. traveled well. We filled Perkins Stadium. Yep. Blast. I could talk about that the rest of the show, but I won't because we're going to take a break, and then it's the J.A. Lightning Round. So we're back in a bit. Coach Lance Leipold with KU and UW Whitewater and Buffalo and Nebraska. You get it. The Inside Wisconsin Show. The Inside Wisconsin Show is brought to you by American Family Insurance, Aaron's Company, Blaine's Farm and Fleet, Capital Credit Union, Festival Foods, Quick Trip, Miller Lite, North Star Mohican Casino Resort, Provea Health, and the University of Wisconsin Platteville. Hey, remember to subscribe on YouTube, leave a review, smash the like button, just get with us. Football season, beer season. Same thing. They go together. Are you a fantasy football guy? I am not, but here's why. Add? Yeah, tell here's me. Why. I did it once. I did it one one season because ESPN asked us to have teams, you know, to sort of plug the thing. And my team was uh, Alephine Tuliamuk. That's she's a really great runner, and I just thought, what a fun name for a football team, Alephine Tuliamuk. That was the name of my team. Uh, but but here's why: because I can only root for my team, yeah. and I couldn't imagine like, could you draft Randy Moss on your team because he nope. gets you a ton of points and then root for Randy Moss? No, that's I, why I suck at it. Right. I couldn't like, I'm going to need you to draft, uh, you know, Dak Prescott. No. So I just, I, by the way, how, how Wisconsin did that sound? No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, it comes out once in a while. Yeah, but yeah, it does. So I can't, I can't draft people. I can't pretend to root for other teams players because I, I don't. So I like to think it's because I'm pure of heart that that is it, why I do not participate. I do participate and I absolutely suck at it because there's no way I could have anybody on the jets on my team this year. There's yep. no way I can have Bears, Correct. Vikings, none of it. Mm -mm, can't do it. But the parties are good. The draft party's fun. Draft Get a cooler Miller Lite football, beer, what? Draft parties for beer. Football games for beer. Tailgate for beer. What are you doing after the game? Let's go get a beer. Like, it's beer. But Monday night, we're not playing, but come to my house. Let's watch a beer. Super Bowl <laughs> party. Awesome. Only two teams are in that. Let Yeah. Beer season. 
Football. Miller Light season. Football season, Miller Light season. Uh, yep, have Miller Light. We'll travel. You tell me where we're going. Make it Miller time all season long. Get Miller Light delivered right to your door. Visit MillerLight.com slash Inside Wisconsin, or you can find it pretty much anywhere that sells beer. Celebrate responsibly. Miller Brewing Company, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 96 calories and 3.2 cars per 12 ounces. Do you think you could get Miller Light delivered to your door there in Arkansas? You should try that just to see what happens. Probably, but at least there's a bar downstairs. And that so helps. They um, have I it. I actually enjoyed one last night with the track coach. So there you have it. <laughs> we were doing that. By the way, so I don't do fantasy football. I do do an NCAA bracket. And I yes. never win that, though, because uh, I always pick KU to lose in the first round. Yeah, that's all. Awesome. Far none. Never matter. Never. <laughs> always. Didn't work Fitting. out the last few years. We're back. The final segment with Coach Lance Leipold, Trevor John, wardrobe yep. change. We'll get to that. Two quick ones from me. Number one, we talked about Tim Keene and Duck Sizer. Those are our buddies that we share back from Jefferson amongst a whole bunch of others. There was this thing called Air Jefferson back in your high school days. Who was the best player on that football team? Air Jefferson. Oh, wow. Jeez, all my friends are going to be mad. I'm going to go with wide receiver Todd Lindsay. Yeah, you're right. Your oh, friends God. are going to be mad. You probably should have chosen yourself, to be honest. Let's be real. You mentioned it earlier, last one, then the lightning round. There's something about home. You mentioned margaritas when we were off the air. That's where Tim is up here in Green Bay. You mentioned Wadle's hamburger stand. When you come back to Wisconsin, whether it's Madison or Green Bay or back home in Jefferson, what's the one spot you got to go to? Oh, boy. You know, it used to be, I'll just say this, back when our, it used to be Summerfest, to be quite honest, and if we get back there just because then you get to hit a lot of different things and see people. Um, boy, I – yeah, I would. I would probably say I, the other one's Fort Atkinson, Salamone's Pizza. There's one of those in there yeah. that you you kind of you kind of get one there. And just quickly on this, guys, all that is that as you know, being from Wisconsin, I think I am so blessed to have so many friends, lifetime friends. A lot of times you just have acquaintances, mm -hmm. and and sometimes getting home makes that tough. Yeah, John talks about his lifetime friends from Green Bay constantly. We call it John Wisconsin. Yeah, and we're lucky okay. none, of us, none of us have been incarcerated. So that's really, you know, our parents feel like they've done a really good job of parent that, that they've raised them down the straight and narrow. So, see, so Trevor mentions like he's going to get killed if he doesn't mention these guys. Yeah. Right? If I'm on here with the KU coach and my Missouri people don't see that I represent some small, I, I will be thrown out of the Alumni Association and everything else. So these, now, coach, I'm just going to give you some rapid ones. We're just going to go through. Hopefully this doesn't take much time, okay? So this is the most important question that not only for you, I bet to your constituent as well. Uh, when is the next Mizzou KU game? 25. I mean, that's or, awful general. 2025, what's the date? Uh, I think it's like first or second week. It's of, September 6th, and at the time of this taping, it's 749 days away. I don't know if you want to put a little pull calendar in your office, but you might think about it. Well, it was supposed to be the Liberty Bowl last year, but that's another conversation. I, listen, if we, if we are off this, I'll tell you how we handle that. We go. So, or maybe Andy's in the background. I'm sweaty, Andy. I'm sweating. Okay, no, keep going. Okay, I'll tell you that afterwards. Uh, you were how old when you knew coaching could be your profession? Fourteen. Good. Huh. Uh, there is only one basketball coach at KU with a losing record. Who is it? Oh, do not know. It's the best trivia question ever. Dr. James Naismith, the dude who invented the game, huh. is the only dude with a losing record at KU, which is staggering. Uh, how many career football wins for Fog Allen? Ooh. 20. He has 34. Not bad. Okay. 746, yeah. Uh, name the coach that was at Buffalo and KU before you. Did you Turner Gill. Turner Gill, excellent. Favorite Packer growing up? John Brockington. Recently passed away. Shame. Love 42. Four um, good seasons, right? I don't even know if I'm going to. Yeah, the first three. First guy ever to have a thousand yards rushing in his first three seasons. Uh, I, if I mispronounce this, excuse me, but what the heck are uh, Gamutlikite days? Gamutlikite days. German yeah, heritage Gamutlikite. days. Pretzel eating contest, beer, beer drinking, you know, the usual. Very good. Uh, I've looked at your high school. I've looked at, at your college. What's the difference between an eagle and a warhawk? Ooh. Eagles, Eagles soar alone. I don't know. Yeah, I don't either. They just look the same to me. 
I guess uh, I got birds, Jayhawks, Warhawks, Eagles. I'm a I'm a, a lot of birds. Bird kind of guy. Uh, <laughs> who's Joel Jamac? Joel Jamac was our kicker and punter at Whitewater. Did you go to high school with Joel? Classmate of mine, one year ahead. Yeah. Better yeah, punter, yeah. Matt Turk or Joel Jamac? Got to go with Matt Turk. Yeah, it's Joel Jamac. <laughs> I'm, brand, I'm, I'm brand loyal. Uh, you rank where on Whitewater's all-time passing yardage list? Ooh, these days, I oh, geez, I think I'm out of probably 11th. Nope, you're at eighth. Okay. Explain this stat. You were fifth in attempts and 10th in completions. I wasn't very good or accurate. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, hey, name the and, and I get one cap out of the, We didn't throw bubble screens in those days. Yeah, this sideways thing. Forget it. Uh, name the four new Big 12 schools. Arizona, Arizona State. Oh, no, I got to go. Which ones now? The most recent? The ones that will be on your schedule this year. BYU, BYU, Cincinnati, UCF, and Houston. Okay. Now, I mean, four Rock Valley Conference schools. Beloit Turner, Orfordville, Parkview, Broadhead, Excellent. and Milton. Yeah. He just keeps going. And now, this is the, this is, this is the second most inqu- important question. And if your AD is there, he can help you out. Which team won the 1960 Mizzou KU game? KU. Maybe on the scoreboard, but in the record book, that is a forfeit, and thus Missouri has <laughs> the career, the most career wins in that series. All-time wins, 1960. Yeah, you guys used an illegal player. Try not to do that this time around. Okay. Hey. Lance, seriously, I appreciate you coming by. Thanks so much. And as much as I like to, uh, uh, you know, the rivalry is terrible. Um, A few years ago at the Walter Camp Awards, Coach Mangino was the coach of the year Mm -hmm. in 2007. And I came out there and I said, you know, part of the vitriol between the the two schools is that for so long, it was the difference between having a four-win season, a five-win season, or a three-win and a four-win. And that year, then they were great and we were great. And we met at the end of the year. You're like, so this is what Alabama Auburn is like. This is like, so I hope to death that you have great success. And I hope drink does too, so that when we can meet, like the game is meaningful other than, hey, who's going to go off and have three wins? Because when both teams are great, whether it was in basketball or track or any of these things, um, it, it's so much it's so much healthier because now we're rooting for our team and it's so against the other. So I wish you nothing but success. I hope I, I will be there in 2025. You can you can rest. I'll be there in 25. I'll be there in 26. And if I'm alive, I'll be there in 31 and I'll be there in 32 as well. I wouldn't miss it. So thanks for your time. Good luck to you. Uh, hope all is well. And I hope to see game day again. And uh, say hi to Coach Sell for me when you get a minute. Will do. Will do. Thanks, guys. That was a lot of fun. Okay, I'm done sweating. Let me just I'm gonna I'm gonna lay this out. First off, thanks to coach for coming on. That was great. Yeah. Excellent. John, you, you have not shied away from the rivalry that is KU and Mizzou. I you did me and Wisconsin a favor there. So thank you for doing that. I appreciate it. And I did notice this. Listen, you missed the that- you you got all out of whack because of Mount Union. I did. You're like I, I love that. You're like, oh, you were scared of me, huh? Yeah, well. Yeah. Um, I did notice that you yeah. didn't say the name of the university coach works for a single no. time, not one. No. Big 12 school. Whatever you want. <laughs> By the way, I don't know if you knew this. I I don't want to get too into grammar and correct people, but you you do know why you don't ever capitalize the word Kansas, correct? <laughs> no, but go for uh, it. Because it is not a proper name nor a proper place. <laughs> okay. All and right. Thus, you never have to capitalize it. Ugh. I am grateful that you saved all of this for when coach was no longer on the call. Anyway, no, I, no, no. listen, I, I don't I don't mean to put you in bad spots. I've told you this off the air. I, I, that's yeah. difficult. You are involved with Missouri's recruiting, and you're you're obviously an alum and the passion. And I, I was saying this to Amanda before we jumped on this call. I don't think we here in Wisconsin, whether it's Whitewater and Mount Union or Wisconsin and Minnesota or the Brewers and the Cubs, there is yeah. nothing comparable to this Mizzou-Kansas thing. So thank you. That's my way of saying things. Yeah, it, it, it goes back a ways. So, a little bit. Yeah, you're yeah. pretty educated on it, so, too. So, that, so that's what I'm going to give you for John, Wisconsin. Okay. All right. Okay. Which is more John, Missouri, but or Missouri. I started school in Missouri when I time I left, it was Missouri. Either sure. one is acceptable, by the way. 
So when I came down to school, when I got uh, when I chose to go to journalism school and Coach Teal was uh, uh, kind enough to let me, you know, uh, run on his track team for a while. And despite sort of physical and athletic shortcomings, managed to stay, stay in the team through all four seasons and was actually a captain of the team my senior year. I don't know if you knew that. I was. A, I didn't know that. You told me. Yeah. So anyway. I have no, I have none of this, right? I think, oh yeah, Wisconsin, Iowa, we just like each other a lot. And Wisconsin, Minnesota, that's terrible. And only years after, I'm like, wait a minute, all the people that are from Wisconsin moved to Minnesota never come back. Can't be that horrible. <laughs> but and so I kind of heard that Mizzou and Kansas, that's the rivalry. I don't know till deeper into that that it is based in the Civil War and Quantrill's raid and all these things that people can look up on their own. But we go to our first Big Eight conference meet. And my coach, Bob Teal, who will turn 100 this year in September. And Coach Teal uh, went to the university, coached the university from Missouri, the whole thing. He's, he's indoctrinated. Coach Teal is the most Southern gentleman that you will ever meet. Still dressed up, more a hat for, for track meets. Don't know that I've ever seen Coach say anything more than dad gum. Um, he did not talk a lot. And so when he did, you listened really hard. And he had homespun advice that used to be like, listen, the more you can do, the more you can do. I'm like, well, well that, that's corny. And then as you get older, you're like, no, that's actually true. So we're in this, we're in this, my first meet. And I, I'm like the 25th guy on a 25 man traveling squad as a freshman. And now we have our team meeting the night before, and he's saying, you know, here's the progressions. We're going to open the high jump at six, eight and a half. And I'm like, holy crap, we're opening higher than my high school PR. I'm going to have to jump that on the first try. Yeah. And and so we go through this, and he goes, and then coach, uh, we took the coach's vote, and men, uh, they picked us seven in the big eight. There weren't 12, there weren't 14, there weren't 16, whatever. Uh, he goes, we, we're seventh. And he stood in front of us and he goes, and I've seen, I know everybody in this room. I know what we are. I know what we can run. I know what we're capable. And if we go out and do our best, we will be in the top half of this field. Don't worry. But he said, I'll tell you this, man. If we're seventh, and he kind of started to pause and get red and get emotional. And he said, if we're seventh, I, I don't care if we're seventh as long as eighth place. And now he's, and finally, he just goes, men, I would rather spit than be a Jayhawk. Oh, and we all went about ran out of the room like, you know, it's 11 at night. And we're like, let's go. Where's the gym? We're in Nebraska. Where's the Devaney Center? Let's go. We are ready to go right now. And so that was really my indoctrination. Here's this guy that just literally the classiest human being I know and the best man I've ever met aside from my own father. And yeah, he's, I would rather spit than be a Jayhawk. And he wow. said, and that's and that's we how you got introduced go. right there. And we finished second. And I, we I take to, it. We were runner up to Iowa State. Wow. But we beat Nebraska, who was supposed to be better than us. We beat all these teams. KU at that time was not supposed to be better than us. K State would have been good. But yeah, so we went out and we finished second. And then after that, then, you know, by that time, then you know, there were basketball games and you'd go through the whole thing. And then, yeah, then I was fully indoctrinated. But it took Coach Teal to tell me that he would rather spit than be. A, and to this day, right, if, if pe you can cuss out people. Right? That's where y'all you know, drop F-bombs and show you how much I hate this. Like, I just think I'd rather spit than be a Jayhawk. And I'm like, that, that's a that that's as fierce a thing as I could ever say about that from Coach Teal. So and, and I, that I'm, was I'm, I am proud that in uh, that I will be there with a bunch of my old teammates and, and guys that ran for him over the 20 years. He was the coach uh, and we'll be there to see him for his 100th birthday, which will be really an amazing. That's really cool. Yeah, that's cool. So, and it's just so this whole rivalry thing from that point on now, that's in. It is what it is. I mean, you guys have. Listen, and I, they'll probably watch this to see how we did. And that's great. And we are thankful for Leopold and all that stuff. But, uh, yeah, I, I dislike those people with the passion of the 10,000 sons. <laughs> and that's why I got sweaty, because I've never had anybody hate anything like 10,000 sons. And so when you sent me that text, I'm like, oh, all right, this is I'm good. I'm good. We're good. We're going to be fine. It's all good. And it was. Yeah. It really was. That was a great interview with Coach Leipold and uh, reminiscing about Whitewater and just his time uh, both in Wisconsin and Nebraska and, and back in Whitewater. Well, and then... uh, yeah, he just uber successful that he's carried on from Whitewater. And it is my fear that that they're going to be too good. 
right? Part of being a Mizzou fan is to be completely insecure in everything, right? You, you take <laughs> as much joy in a Kansas loss as you do in your own win. Uh, but uh, when we're taping this, as I said, 749 days to that game, and I, I just, I'm praying he finds a new job in 749 days. Somebody <laughs> hopefully will offer him one of those, you know, six million dollar a year SEC buy. I don't care where it is, Mississippi State, Vandy, Ole Miss, whatever. I just, I just, I, yeah, I'd rather not. You know, plus in the end, then people are going to go, Wisconsin, you know, they got him like, yeah, and he's likable. And then they're going to go, well, why don't you go sit somewhere else? If that's the kind of, you know, <laughs> you know, that, that, you know, that kind of disappointing, let me know. Oh, man. Well, it was Wisconsin through and through a whole bunch of coaches, yeah. obviously with them. Andy, the communications guy, thanks for setting this up. He's from Watoma. And of course, Lance Leipold, a Jefferson grad, and we know him best from Whitewater, man. All right. Well, uh, hey, get back to your kids down there in Arkansas. How nice of a dad to jump on with us <laughs> while you're bringing your kids back to college. So we will uh, catch you soon. For John, I'm Trevor. As you were, Wisconsin, we'll see you soon. Prairie de Sac, Wisconsin, the Wollersheim Winery. Julie, Celine, thank you for having us out. We are standing in the courtyard. Is that fair? I'm going to learn a lot of wine words today and maybe a few distilling words. Farmers, brewers, hunters, packers, badgers, cheeseheads, neighbors. No matter what name we go by, we are bound together by our roots. These are the people, the stories, and the statriotism from inside Wisconsin. Welcome to Deeper Roots with Blaine's Farm and Fleet. So the winery itself and this grounds is old, old, well before you and your families got here. Property was started as a winery in the 1840s. Vineyards were planted here on the hillsides. Wine was made in the cave on the hillside. So there were really three different families here. So the first family was a Gustin Harazzi. So he was a Hungarian immigrant. He saw these hillsides overlooking the Wisconsin River and thought it was a great place to grow grapevines. So that's what he did for a couple of years. Julie, it's a little echoey. Hello, where are we? We are in the hillside cave, the first structure built on the property. Literally the first one back in the 1860s, most likely. Yes, 1850s. the back, actually the back portion is hand hewn out of the sandstone. So you can kind of see the, it's chiseled out. And so that first part was for aging wine. And then the middle part of the cave where it's kind of the Jordan arch, we're not quite sure when that part was built, mm -hmm. but this later part was built and used as a house for a winter before the regular house was built. What was it about their Hungarian history that made them go, oh yeah, we can do this here? When Augustin Harazzi saw the hillside here overlooking the Wisconsin River, it reminded him of his homeland, you know, with the rivers and, and there is a little bit of a microclimate, keeps it a little bit milder. The hope was, you know, with the great sun exposure, with the hill, steep hillsides, um, that this would be a good place to grow grapes. Then he got to know Wisconsin winters, decided it was pretty cold. <laughs> and he followed the gold rush on 1849 to look for gold. So wine in America, when everybody thinks of Napa Valley, it actually started in Wisconsin. Yeah. Wisconsin. Augustine Harazzi was known for planting the first hops in Wisconsin too. Wine and beer all started sure. from this cat right yeah. here on your <laughs> yeah. property? Wow, I love you people so much. <laughs> and then what happened thereafter? He sold the property to his right-hand man, Peter Kale. Peter Kao was a German family. He built the house, the winery here as a winery. They made wine here for two generations. They, that second generation, they also made brandy to fortify the wine. Probably the uh, first brandy in Wisconsin, let's that's, be honest. That's, was, that's what the records say. Roll. Is yeah. it really? <laughs> 1876. It's their it's fault. A, that could be. <laughs> we are the old fashioned capital of the world. Maybe. Then the third and fourth uh, didn't make wine after the vineyards all froze out. Then the property was just kind of converted to dairy farming. All the wine barrels were sold during Prohibition. 1972, my parents bought the property and started it out as a winery again. So there's a tipping point here where your parents in the early 1980s, 83, 84, wanted to bring somebody here to be a winemaker, yes? Must have been a good looking young man, yeah. Julie. Because that's your husband yeah. today, yes? Philippe came over from France, yes? And his job was to be the winemaker. This is your parents' idea, yes? Yep. And yep. then he meets you. Yep. Like we say, then the rest is history. And the rest is history, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Philippe, when you came here in 1984, did you ever think that this would all be yours someday? No, no, actually, I didn't even know where Wisconsin was. <laughs> I had to look on a map. Growing grape, I couldn't believe. Uh, 
I, my goal was to go to California and Australia. And well, guess what? I ended up here in Madison, Wisconsin. I couldn't believe wine was being made and then I fell in love. With Julie. Yes. Yeah, that's a funny story. Everywhere there's history about this, they constantly remind you that you fell in love with the farmer's daughter. Absolutely, all the time. That's and about that, as Wisconsin as it gets, man. You and, fit in perfectly. And that's okay. I, you know, it, it's a great story. Um, it wasn't easy at the beginning. You know, different culture, different food. And on top of that, we didn't have any money. So it was rough and tough until uh, this little wine came along and that just turned everything around. This is the one that essentially saved the business. Is yes, that fair? Yes, absolutely. 1988, I came up with this wine called Prairie Fumé. It was in a style of a Pinot Grigio, style of a Sauvignon Blanc, and uh, with Midwestern grown grapes. And the concept was something fresh, fruity, light, feminine. In 1989, we released this wine on the market. It got four gold medals and the buzz was out. You know, it helped the state of Wisconsin. It helped to create a Wisconsin wine section in all the stores. It did a lot of good for a lot of people in the wine business. Cheers. So you say cheers? Santé. That too. Uh -huh. That too. Listen, I know that there's a lot of wineries in Wisconsin. Fairly certain this is the only winery where the the original winemaker has a thick French accent. Uh, you got it. You're right. It's the, the French accent and uh, passing on the knowledge to, uh, to Céline, uh, French winemaking, French ability to taste, and she has it. Very proud to have her with me. The future of the business is insured, so I can go and play. So you two are the ones that operate today, but your daughter Celine and her family are obviously here on the grounds. Talk to us about what it means now. This is third generation. That's really fulfilling for us because you know all the hard work that we put into this property over decades, you know, knowing that it'll be carried on by the next generation. Celine, good thing you like wine. I do. <laughs> Because, I mean, let's be honest, it's not for everybody's palate. It's not. But it's in your blood. It is definitely in my blood. It took me all of like 26 years to even drink a beer. Oh? <laughs> That's how much wine is in your blood. <laughs> and now you have a distillery. Talk we about do. when that started. Yeah, that started in 2010. So in 2009, mom and a few other distillers in the state got the laws changed to allow wineries to distill um, because before that, we weren't allowed to do any distillation. And my husband was kind of joking, you know, oh, it'd be really fun, like Wisconsin brandy's great, but a Wisconsin bourbon would be way better, right? Because he grew up drinking bourbon with his family. We were able to expand into some botanical spirits and then a lot of whiskeys. We expanded into another building. I can't wait to see that yeah. building. This is as family as it gets. Absolutely. This is Tom. Tom is married to Celine. The idea of distilling is fairly new here, right? There were some law changes and then you guys really jumped in cannonball style. We began distilling Cocard Brandy, which is our like all Wisconsin take on a cognac. We had our first product release in 2013 at Cocard Brandy and we basically sold out in about six hours. So the two mile is gonna be, um, well it's 90 proof, uh, it's got a sweeter profile with a little bit of, little bit of rye backbone um, to give it some spice and some like herbal notes but it's not too overpowering. The family side of this whole thing is just incredible. As a family and being independently family owned, we don't chase trends, you know, we make things we like. That's really the business model. How many different kinds of grapes do you have in the property? We have six different varieties. And then in the spirit of experimentation, just like my grandpa always did, we have a little experimental field where we try in new varieties, to see how they would do on our site in comparison to all the other varieties that we've had. What type are we about to sample? This is Marichal Foch. This is one of the f first grapevines that uh, worked for my grandpa here. An older variety of uh, French American grapes. What will I experience as we try these? They're super sweet. The skins are a little thicker and there's seeds in the middle. Mm -hmm. Unlike a table grape. They're a lot more intense. Mm-hmm. Does your best-selling wine come from that grape? Our, our Keystone wine, our flagship wine, our Domain Reserve comes from that. We'll actually taste that out of the barrel, you and I later. Out of the barrel? Out of the barrel. Let's go yeah. there. This is the cellar. So we're underground. Three of the walls are underground. The walls are about two feet thick, so it stays 
cool and humid all year round. How old is this cellar? Uh, this was built in the 1850s, this portion. It took them 10 years to complete this whole building. Shh, water resting. Yeah. So That's the cool waters are really quiet. What are we about to taste? We are about to taste Domaine Reserve. So it's made with Marichal Foch grapes that we tasted earlier. And this is a really special wine for us. It comes from the first vines that were planted on the hillside. And it's the first vines that my grandparents planted when they came here in the 70s. It's aged in a hybrid barrel of Wisconsin and French oak staves. So I'm gonna pull the bun. Got it. What is the piece called that you are about to serve the wine on? This is called the wine thief. Thief? I'm thieving it out of the barrel, I like yeah. So I have, you hold your glass right up next to mine. So the trick is to be the one with the thief, because if you're serving a whole bunch of people, you always get the most wine at the end. <laughs> so what are we experiencing out of the barrel that we wouldn't experience out of the bottle? Right now, this is a lot younger tasting. It doesn't have that really soft, open, silky fruit note yet, because it's just, it still has to age. I'm gonna finish this. What does it mean to you that now you're the third generation winemaker here? You're not doing it for yourself. You're doing it for the next generation. You're doing it for the legacy that's you know been left for you and the legacy that you want to leave to the next generation or the next few. And so I think for us, that's been something really special in our family. That was fun. The tour, the tastings, the scenery, and your story. It's awesome. Thank you so much for having us out. It was a blast. Thank you so much for sharing our story. You can have all the signage you want, but somebody along the way is like, oh, ding, not gonna get chased out here, all right. <laughs> They're a lot more intense. Phew. Mm -hmm. More than one thing, eh? Mm -hmm. This is the cork, yep. right? It's called the bung. The bung? Yeah. Trevor, be a mature adult. You may have to duck. May have to duck? <laughs> Got it. Really good. <clears throat> Caught me a bit there. Is there a napping pod here by chance? Big fan. Will it shine? <laughs> Woo, watch your head. There we go, another great episode of Deeper Roots with Blaine's Farm and Fleet. Awful punchline, low-hanging fruit, moving on. An amazing time there at Wallershine Winery and Distillery, getting to meet the family who makes it all happen. If you've never been, you need to go check them out at wallershine.com or follow along on their social media. It's pretty cool. Speaking of fun, we'd love to meet you and share your family's deep-rooted story. Just go and fill out the form, farmandfleet.com slash deeper roots. We will be there, legacy split, as soon as we hear from you. Don't forget, like and comment below, smash subscribe, and on the podcast side, hit five stars. We'll see you next time. Talk to you later. Bye. Hey, remember to subscribe on YouTube, leave a review, smash the like button, just get with us. The Inside Wisconsin Show is brought to you by American Family Insurance, Aaron's Company, Blaine's Farm and Fleet, Capital Credit Union, Festival Foods, Quick Trip, Miller Lite, North Star Mohican Casino Resort, Provea Health, and the University of Wisconsin Platteville. <laughs>